Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Tom's Hardware Podcast for today, April 6th, 2021. Uh, while folks are filtering in, I just want to remind everyone that we are we always take your questions uh, and comments live on YouTube and Facebook. So in Twitch, if anyone is on Twitch, so uh, so please uh, please feel free. I see someone named Lee has said hi. Hi, Lee. Um, so uh, today's special today, as always, um, I'm Abram Pelch, Tom's Hardware Editor in Chief, and I'm joined by Raspberry Pi expert Ash Puckett. And associate editor Les Pounder, and today's very special guest is Dr. Scott Baker. Hi, Scott. How are you doing? Good. How are you guys doing? We're good. Thank you for joining us. Great. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah. So, thank you for inviting me. So Scott is here to show us a couple of his really fantastic creations. Uh, but uh, why don't you start by telling folks about, about yourself and how uh, you got started with Raspberry Pi and what what you do with it. Yeah, so I've been uh, I've been a hobbyist using Raspberry Pis uh, since the since the original ones the uh, the original one with the with the big RCA jack coming out the side I used that in a few projects I've used um, I've used um, I think maybe the first thing I ever did was uh, an internet radio I think maybe that's a lot of people's first project is uh, you do some kind of an internet radio Pandora box type thing. Maybe that was mm -hmm. the first one. And then I've, I've gone on, I kind of go wherever my hobbies take me, which uh, lately has been in the, uh, in the area of vintage computing. So I've been doing a lot of things where I will um, interface a Raspberry Pi with older, older stuff like um, older floppy drives or older computers. I've actually got some applications where I've stuffed a Raspberry Pi inside of a, inside of an IBM PC, like a 5150 PC, and, and used it as a virtual floppy. Um, and lately, the, the the most recent thing I've done was this project with um, hooking up a 360K floppy to a Pi with a, with a floppy controller. And that one, well, that one turned out to be just unexpectedly popular. Um, everyone seems to be interested in that. Um, it's just yeah. the, the demand of it. They need that technology, obviously. Yeah, I mean, what are we going to do with yeah. all of our old floppies? <laughs> so, so what inspired you to create a uh, 360k floppy floppy controller for the Pi? So it actually started. I was working with an HX20, which is it. Some people call it the the world's first laptop. It's this old Epson thing with like a four line by twenty character display. And I learned that there was at one point this computer, they had developed a, a floppy drive that you can connect to it. It's kind of an intelligent floppy drive. Um, it had, had some, you know, a CPU with the floppy and connect to it over serial. But these things, they're just unobtainable these days. So I figured, why don't I, uh, why don't I make one myself? And, you know, what would be the best way to make one? Well, I will find some way to glue a Raspberry Pi to an old 360K floppy drive and then uh, you know connect it to the Epson. Uh, so that's kind of what that that's sort of the project I'm in the middle of. It's not completely the Epson part of it is not done yet, but the 360k floppy part got done. So I'm like, well, I'll make a blog post on that, and then um, some people found it interesting. So here I am. So have you been able to use that with? Uh, what have you been able to use that with? So the the floppy controller. So. I've used it with um, a Tandon TM100. That was the the sort of full height uh, floppy drive that is in uh, original um, IBM PC. And I've used it with, um, I've actually got one sitting here. I've got this, whoops, there's the camera. This is an SD321. So this is what the Epson would have used. So I, I picked this up on eBay. It's, it's not quite half height. I don't know if you can tell, but it's it's just like slightly shorter than half height. And so I've used it with that uh, because I want to create that uh, Epson project. And then, of course, I've used it with a little uh, high density uh, three and a half inch drive. Uh, works a little bit better on the low density, um, the low density drives, just because uh, I wrote a user mode driver for it, and the Raspberry Pi is, you know, with the default kernel, is not so good at doing real-time tasks, and uh, you can you can uh, do a buffer overrun with high density. The data will just come in too fast to um, to service it from from a Python program. I mean, I thought I thought I was a little bit crazy trying to write a floppy driver in Python, but um, 
hey, it worked. And, uh, and uh, it was fun. And like I say, people have found it useful. Can you use this with uh, with any type of emulation software? So you could, if you had an old Apple II disc or something like that, you could actually play a game on it or something. So I would think eventually. So right now, the the tool I wrote, um, you can sort of you can read and write discs, and you can read and write sectors. There is um, the Linux does support a user mode file system, so I would think you could glue this together and turn it into a, like a user mode block device under Linux. And then you could mount it in your, your SimH emulator or your MAME emulator or something, tie it into that. I would, I would think so. I've not tried that yet myself, um, but I would think it would be possible. Ultimately, what I should do, um, time permitting, uh, which, which time is always short, but um, if this was, if this was uh, written into a kernel mode driver, then you could use it as, as a regular Linux block device. Uh, you would get rid of some of the uh, the buffer overrun problems. So developing a, a kernel mode driver, then this thing could be a normal floppy on a Raspberry Pi and would just appear like a normal floppy. Um, I don't think, have I shown the board itself yet already? No. It is mounted um, in this, um, this Argon Neo case, I think it is. So it's, it's a relatively small board. There's a single IC here, which is the... Um, WD 37 C 65 floppy controller. Then we've got, um, it needs a 16 megahertz oscillator. And, uh, this is a five volt device hooked to a 3.3 volt raspberry Pi. So there is a one K resistor here, which, um, hopefully will, uh, keep the raspberry Pi from, uh, becoming damaged due to the over voltage. But, um, due to the popularity, I have actually, uh, done a minor redesign. I'm going to put a level converter in the next version of it. Um, and that'll be a little bit safer, a uh, little bit better engineered. So, um, yeah, that's that's it. And as you can see, it was a pretty small device. You just um, plug your floppy cable into it and go. Now, I thought the most interesting part of the board was the floppy controller because that's a little Western digital chip, right? That's actually a vintage chip. That's not yeah. easy to find necessarily, right? Yeah, I don't think they. I don't think they're new production. So I got um, I got a few of them on eBay a few years ago. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the RC2014 um, Z80 computer kits. Uh, guy in the UK sold, sold them. Um, I bought one of those, and then I decided I wanted to run CPM on it, so I got these WD37. Yeah, the RC2014. I love that thing. There's actually there's <laughs> there's a couple of them sitting around here. Um, yeah, there's one yeah. behind me on a pile somewhere. <laughs> a whole pile of boards for them. Um, but yeah, so I, I made a floppy controller for it and, uh, I used the same chip and then I, I had to do a few little changes to the, the CPM software, the ROM, uh, RBW. So I was relatively familiar with this chip and how to interface it and, um, how it works. So I figured, you know, I'll just hack this up in an evening, stick it on a Raspberry Pi and, uh, see if I could make it work. And, and lo and behold, it actually did work. Wow. That's that's great. So can you use it with a 3.5 inch floppy or only with five and a quarters? Yeah. Yeah. With the um, standard high density three and a half inch drive, it, it works with that. Um, like I mentioned, it because of the higher data rate, you will end up with some retries with the user mode driver. So um, it fails maybe one to 3% of the blocks it tries to transfer. And then uh, it, the failure is not fatal. It can just go retry it, but it's, a little bit detrimental to performance because there's there seems to be a little hit to motor RPM when it fails. It's got to like spin down, spin back up. So maybe this um, ends up taking 50% longer to read a three and a half inch disc than than you would like. Um, still, it may be faster than some vintage computers read a three and a half inch disc. Uh, surprising when I boot something up, just how slow it can be to read a floppy disc these days. Do you have a lot of vintage computers? A few, a few. So I've got, uh, I've got a Tandy 1000. Um, that was the first, you know, real um, PC compatible type computer I owned. Um, the one I own is not mine. Mine was, was lost to time years ago, but I found one on eBay. It's Tandy 1000 is fun. Um, I've got uh, IBM 5150, which, you know, that's of course the original IBM PC. Those things are, are fun to play with. And I've got 
some of these convergent engine computers and the convergent technologies computers, they were really interesting. They were in the, uh, the 80s and they're very modular design. So you would have a CPU unit and then your disk unit snaps to the side of it and you could snap on a graphics unit. And um, those things are really cool. So I actually have like a four part video series where I restored one of those and I had to reverse engineer the the, um, the video format because it had some weird video connector and come up with a keyboard converter because it had some weird keyboard um, and managed to actually get it to work. So I. I do like playing with the uh, with the vintage um, computers. Um, the stuff is it, it's getting harder and harder to find though. Um, so some of this yeah. stuff you can't find the software. You can find pieces of software here and there, um, or, or the hardware will be up on eBay, but it'll be some just crazy price for something, and it's very hit or miss if you, if you're into the vintage computer hobby. Yeah, no, no, no question about it. It's. Uh it's it's a it's amazing like how many of these things are still running but it's ex but it's ex an expensive hobby if you really want to get one that's in good shape uh, so this isn't your only raspberry pi project that you've done you've done a lot of them and you were showing us some before what are some of the other cool things you've made with yeah pi? so let me um let me see if i can move the camera around a little bit um this here was my um nixie tube calculator so the pi is kind of oh there's my finger yeah it's kind of down here in the bottom um oh there's my daughter behind it yeah um <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so uh, one two three yeah that was one of one of the well there was probably already something in the accumulator um yeah it, it can add correctly so don't don't think it can't add but yeah that was um I actually put this on on Kickstarter like um, oh maybe five or seven years ago or so. It didn't succeed on Kickstarter. I kind of set a high price for it just because I was a little bit worried, you know, that my my uh, my day job I would have to explain to my bosses, you know, how how am I going to um, spend a month making calculators and <laughs> take some time off, but. Uh, Fortunately, you know, that's one of those things where you're afraid of succeeding with something like the calculator project, but it's documented on my website and, you know, you can actually build one if you want. Was it hard um, to find all those Nixie tubes? Uh, the Nixie tubes, you get those, um, I think I get them from the Ukraine. Those are, I think they're IN-12s. Uh, so I've got lots of Nixie tube projects around. I don't think I have anything else plugged in I can show you on the Nixie tube project, but... Uh, they're high voltage, so there's a little high voltage supply in there. Mm -hmm. There's some some driver chips that also came from the Ukraine, and, and um, I've got shift registers, so the the Pi talks to it over a simple two wire um, clock and data type protocol. So pretty pretty fun little project. Um, let's see, up on the wall, uh, there we go. There is uh, Conway's uh, Game of Life. They're running on that Raspberry Pi with, uh, I think that display came from Adafruit. And above it, I've got um, Environmental Monitor that does my um, dust, um, temperature, humidity, carbon dioxide, kind of a data collection thing. I, I'm kind of like uh, data collection type uh, projects. So I've, I've got some stuff like that. Um, Did you make a cool dashboard for your little environmental your box the little orange box up there um which dashboard did you see did you make a dashboard for it like you said that oh, it's collecting data yeah. how do you see it? yeah let me um here and let's see if i can pull it up really really quickly in grafana Ooh, it's gonna look good mm, grafana yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah so i use um i use grafana a lot um let's see everything environmental I've seen with monitor it looks good. Um, let's see. I can't, um, I've actually hidden the chat. So, oh, that's neat. Though. Oh, that, that, that well, no, oh, that, now I'm looking at the chat. Well, of course, there I don't know go. if you can see the display there or not, but yeah, you can yeah. see, um, yeah. yeah, the particulate matter. There was actually a fire in the area. Let's see. Is the fire in there? You're going to be the Come first on, one to know. Yeah, right there. So yeah, that I left my window open and the particulate matter sensors actually peaked. So yeah, I, I like uh, I like data collection. Data collection is uh, it, it's yeah. fun, and uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of projects you can do. You know, interfacing the Pi to sensors like that. I've got 
actually got a couple things up on the wall up there that um, one of them's got a sensor. It's actually a, a project for work. There's some uh, cellular dongles hooked to those Raspberry Pis over there um, and um, just doing a cellular project there. So um, I once told myself I could count uh, 12 Pis from my desk that were actually plugged in. I would I would probably be challenged to look around and find them all, but I, I would not be surprised if there are a dozen. There's, I've got a 3D printer over there. It's got two Raspberry Pis on it, so they're they're <laughs> everywhere. I I, li I like the Pi. I use I use um, I use the um, the the zero W a lot. I use it in a lot of projects. So let's see. Well, this thing. It's a handy one. Gizmo here. Reach. This was. Um, Always hard to aim things here. So this has a vacuum fluorescent display in it. Um, nice. I'd always wanted a Hayes chronograph, uh, but Hayes chronographs, like another vintage thing from the 80s, they're they're hard to find. There's a few of them on eBay for like $600 to $1,500 or something crazy. So I just I figured I'll make myself a miniature one. Uh, so it's got a Pi Zero W in there and a vacuum fluorescent display and. Uh, a VFD controller and some kind of step up regulator I put together for the for the VFD. So, yeah, I, I, the the stuff litters litters the office. <laughs> we we know that all too well. So, I, we're going to ask you the question that we ask all of our guests: How many Raspberry Pis do you do you have? How many do I have? I would say probably two dozen between two and three dozen probably you know counting ones that are in use as well as ones that are in the in the in the box of obsolete raspberry pies so there's there in the obsolete box there's you know there's the original one there's a bunch of twos there's some threes uh they, they kind of get me every time they bring out a new one i've got to like replace them all with the, with the better ones so yeah. um, have you played with the pico yet because that's gonna i have not so i have fast. not oh, yeah i so have pretty. Yeah, I wanna I wanna play with one of those. Lately, I've been doing ESP eighty two sixty sixes for some of my small projects, but I wanna I wanna do I wanna try out the Raspberry Pi Pico because it's something I have I have not experienced yet. I've I've only messed with the Linux based uh, Raspberry Pis, so the Pico would would be something fun to play with. So speaking of speaking of things that are used that are pico or pico like and using rp2040 less you've got a new board a new board to show us that's rp2040 powered i have indeed yes on the desk in front of me right now is the micro mod which is from spark fun it's an rp2040 board that's because you have a camera there you go and it's this thing in the center and i've got a little image just on the screen you can see as well so you can see what it looks like it's not very really clear it's a tiny board and you notice it's uh, on a, a carrier board. So it's an M.2 slot for this tiny little board, and it breaks out 75 pins. Now, that's more pins than what a Pico has. That's got 40 pins with 28 usable uh, GPIO pins. We get all the GPIO pins, power pins, I squared C, uh, SPI, everything that we need in this form factor. But to use it, we need a carrier board. Now, this is a board called All the Pins, ATP also from SparkFun. I've been messing around with this today. And great fun. Some quirks I need to work out, but I'll work through that. I'm just having a few conversations at the moment, trying to work out how it all works and gets together. And just to prove what you can do with it, just a very simple proof of concept, blinking an LED. It's what we all do as electronics engineers. So I've just got some simple Python code just to blink the LED at random. So the first three pins, are, sorry, the first three lines, just importing three libraries, the pin class, sleep function, and a function called uniform from random, which gives us random floats. So floating numbers, which are numbers with decimal places. I've then got an LED object, which I'm setting up as a pin on pin six. This is one of the quirks, pin six on the Pico equates to D zero on this board on the carrier board, the ATP. That's a little quirk I'm trying to work out. And then just a while true loop, a forever loop, in other words, sets the duration of variable to be a random number between 0 0.1 and 3.0. It then prints that number to the screen so we can see, turns the LED on, it sleeps, so it pauses, it waits for that duration. 
Then it turns the LED off for 0 0.2 seconds and it goes back and creates another random, in, a random float. And as you can see in the shell, it's spitting out all those numbers and the LED is blinking to match that duration. So this is proof of concept to make sure that we can communicate with the board, that we understand how it works, that we can work out the kinks. If we don't do that, then we spend a lot of time debugging and trying to find problems and try and solve them. And I've done that myself a few times. But interesting board. I like the form factor. I like the fact that I can take out this RP2040 from this carrier board and stick in another board, such as, uh, let's see, an ESP32 straight away. And that board will become an ESP32 with all these breakout pins. Or I can put in this, P this Pico board, the RP2040, and I can carry on hacking away. So it's going to be interesting to see what you can do with this form factor and the supporting ecosystem of accessories that are going to come with it. Yeah, so uh, just a preview for the audience. Next week, we're actually having Spark Fun on, uh, and they're going to show us uh, they're going to show us their complete RP2040 line, including this and the uh, presumably some of the other carrier boards which is really neat. I have a question about your code. You said that you had to, that it's D0 on the carrier board, but GPIO 6 on the Pico. So why didn't you have to reflect that in the code? So that's what the problem I've got at the minute. The pin numbering in real life doesn't uh, equate to what is in the code. So what the, what the Pico believes is the number that it has. So to find this number, I had to use a for loop that iterated all, over all 28 GPIO pins to find out which ones I could blink. And luckily, I found six quite quickly. I'm not sure why. I'm, I'm guessing it's because this ATP board, I'll just go over here, is designed to be a, a, a breakout board for all of the range of these Macromod boards. So they can't be specific in the pin numbering. And because the RP2040 is so brand new, it hasn't been reflected in documentation as yet. It's something I'm investigating. I'm speaking to SparkFun about this, see if we can work out some system to convert numbers over from what it believes the carrier board number is to what the Pico believes the number is. Great. So what was that other thing on your desk? What other thing? The circular thing. Ah, okay. Is this was something. Going? Yeah, something I was sent by a friend of mine from Pocket Moneytronics, Andrew Gale. It is a Pico 360. This is a soldering project that I soldered up on uh, Friday last week. The board is about four pounds, so about five or six dollars, roughly. And it's a, a soldering kit to get you started with soldering, because that's what Pocket Moneytronics, Pocket Moneytronics, is all about. But it's also designed straight for the Pico. So we've got the usual array of LEDs, resistors, two buttons. One controls a buzzer in the software. You can program that. And the other one controls this green LED. But you can program it however you want. It's just a GPIO pin, GPIO 3 and 4 in this case. Got a few GPIO pins broken out there. And we've got some crocodile clip connections on the side to try and keep it in shot. It's... Good little fun. The board is very well put together. So I soldered this on Friday and it took about 15, 20 minutes to solder. And it went really well. Normally with soldering projects, you'll get some joints that are just a little bit too meaty to solder, usually the ground, because you've got a huge ground plane. In this case, every single joint that I soldered was absolutely perfect. And that was with a $5 USB soldering iron that I got from eBay. Nice. So, yeah, good little project. Pocketmoneytronics.co.uk, I think it is. Yeah. Ah, neat. That, uh, you know, my, my son was saying the other day that he would really like, this is his request, I guess, for Adafruit. He would really like a circuit playground that has RP2040 in it. Circuit playground being the uh, very similarly shaped uh, board that yeah. Adafruit makes. He wants... He wants them to make, uh, he wants them to put RP2040 in more products. He wants them to make it's a, a microcontroller. Yes. Yeah. So I'm sure when Adafruit were talking early days about their boards that were coming out, they were well, they're investigating, well, they're creating the Itsy Bitsy, the Cutie Pie, and we've got the Feather. 
I'm yeah. sure there was some mention of a circuit playground with an RP2040, as in, you know, far off in the distance. Yeah. Yeah. We won't let him forget it. We'll just bring it up periodically, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, what he, well, the other thing he really wants, and this is kind of relevant to other stuff, is that he got an early birthday present. Somebody sent him a Pi Gamer, which is their Adafruit's like game handheld game console. But that also doesn't run on on RP twenty forty, but it runs Make Code Arcade, which kind of begs the question: when we'll be able to when when we might be able to run Make Code Arcade on on RP twenty forty. Um, but so 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 Scott, um, we have some people uh, in the chat asking all about floppy disks. Say. <laughs> Am I the only one who is nostalgic for floppy? I recently bought a Sandberg USB floppy driver. What is a Sandberg? Does anybody know what a Sandberg USB floppy driver is? I do not know that one. Um, I know that anything floppies is can be hard to find. Even finding the discs themselves can be hard. Like these uh, five and a quarters. Um, some of those are hit and miss. You get them on uh, from eBay, and you, some won't be readable. Um, you know. Mm -hmm. It looks like the USB three and a half inch. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Yeah. Oh, the uh, the the Sandberg thing. Yeah. 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 I know. I know. Um, gosh, I have a Sony here. Um, maybe it's something like that. It looks because just like these. It, yeah. yeah, these were these mm -hmm. were popular uh, back when you know you you'd get your newer computer and it wouldn't um, it wouldn't have a floppy drive in it you know might not even have a floppy connector anymore and you needed to write a three and a half inch floppy so yeah those things yeah. um you can use those on a modern computer they show up on a windows computer or a linux box is just a normal drive um but only in the three and a half inch form factor is the only thing i've found yes what if you want to read yeah. to read those five and a quarters or what was before five and a quarter eight and a half Eight. Uh, yeah, eight, I actually eight. have an eight around here someplace that I could interface to this if I wanted to. I I believe I did interface it to the RC 2014 uh, years ago. Great. So uh, someone asked, Scott asks, I wonder if there's a CPM emulator for Pi. Does anyone know the answer to that? There is. Ah. I saw the question and I Googled it while we were all talking. Um, <laughs> there's one called CPM EMU. CPMEMU, and it's on Adafruit's site. I'm just to look at it now, and it is a full um, emulator for CPM. Cool. And I think the RC 2014s can do CPM as well. It's a module for them, I think. Yes, we could totally we could totally do a show where it's how to run your how to use all kinds of old media with your Raspberry Pi. We can, you know, now that now that Scott has developed the the floppy disk controller. Someone will have to do the same for zip disks, uh, or maybe you can do. Can you do those over USB? Someone will have to do the same for yep. disk, zip disks, jazz drives, SideQuest, uh, and those cassette players we used to record stuff on the Commodore. Uh, it just, <laughs> and and it. we need we need to do an old MFM hard drive. Why not? I'm blind, yep. Yeah. yep. Just every you know every mm -hmm. old form of storage. Maybe we'll get some reel to reel tapes. Uh, It'll be uh, be cool. So uh, Scott's project was one of the most awesome projects we've seen in a, in a while. And Ash, you have uh, tracked what the best projects are of the month. So what what do you have for us? Yes, it's true. So for those who are new to what we do, every month I collect a list of 10 best Raspberry Pi projects because all week long we're sharing Raspberry Pi projects that people like Scott have created. So today I'm just going to show you guys a couple to get you excited. And if you want to see more, you can find the full list on Tom's hardware. So here's a few. Get us going here. So first I wanted to show you guys this Raspberry Pi Pico, like, I don't know how to describe it. It's like a controller that you can manipulate with hand gestures. It uses a little, um, I'm trying to remember what the thing's called, an accelerometer, I believe. Yeah, that's right. It uses an accelerometer this is an MPU 6050 module. And as you rotate your hand, he has it rigged up here to drive this car in asphalt eight. And for those of you who are just listening and can't see as he's moving his hand forward, the car accelerates as he tilts it to the left and right, the car is moving left and right across the road. 
it's really neat. And he talked about also the creator for this talked about um, developing a custom VR controller. So I thought that was pretty neat because, you know, the Wii came out how long ago? Now we can make our own motion controllers. That's pretty fun. And it uses a Pico, which is just, that's just nuts. This microcontroller can do a lot. Next, I wanted to show you guys this 3D printed circuit. This is a mechanical keypad. It's Pico powered. And instead of creating a PCB, he just 3D printed uh, a little place that you can push. How do I describe this? I'm sorry. So instead of like using a PCB, there are grooves that you can mount copper wire mm. into place and it's moving, I'm moving, it's building a connection between each key and a GPIO on the Pico. So it's, it's entirely 3D printed. You just need a Pico, some copper wires and a 3D printer to put this together. It's just absolutely nuts. I've never seen a 3D printed nice. circuit board before. <laughs> Yeah, I, I want to mention also that we actually have a how-to on our site uh, from Don Hui, who does uh, some does some tutorials for us on how to do something similar to this, uh, where he made it, he made a three D printed keypad that's that's Pico controlled and you could use as a stream deck, uh, as a stream deck like or macro keyboard uh, object peripheral that you can plug in via USB. Oh, that's amazing! Definitely check that out. And then the last one I wanted to show you was this. This, this team launched a Raspberry Pi into the stratosphere. Uh, it's going back to Scott's love for data collection, that's what this project was entirely for. They used a Pi Zero W and they were able to broadcast telemetry data of the journey in real time. It was on a weather balloon. Sorry, not a rocket. It was on a weather balloon. And the entire journey was live streamed on camera. So there were people all over the world watching this Raspberry Pi Zero just travel up into the atmosphere and then scurry back down to space. So you, you really should check out this project because they have a whole video of well the flight so you can see what happened. But watching the team try and find it afterwards was also pretty fun because you know what goes up must come down. So that's what we've got this week. And I think you guys should go check out the full list because these makers make some crazy stuff and it's really, really cool. <laughs> Wow, that is, that is awesome. I just wanted to show folks real quick another Pico project that, uh, that I uh, was working on. So uh, Les showed, uh, I think it was maybe a couple of weeks ago, that yeah. he was able to take the airlift, which is the, a feather wing for, uh, made by Adafruit, which does Wi-Fi, and it also does Bluetooth. Uh, and connecting it to a Pico. Here I have it connected to a Feather RP2040, which is uh, Adafruit, which we actually like even better than the original Pico. If you don't oh, mind yeah. spending uh, about three times as much, it has more memory. It uh, it works with the with the Featherwing ecosystem, which is great. And uh, if you do a firmware update on this on the on the Airlift board, you can make it uh, do BLE. So, uh, so I have over here, I'm just going to share really, uh, really quickly, uh, some code. So over here, I have the Bluetooth code for, uh, for this, I'm going to turn it on. And when I start this up, you'll see that it's going to show nothing, but the Bluetooth is available. Now what I'm going to now what I can do is I can take my phone. Um, hold on a moment. Take my phone. Uh, connect using. So I will zoom out of here. Hold on. Um, take my phone. So over here you have uh, Adafruit's app, which is available for for Android or iOS. I'll click on connect to connect to. The circuit pi and then i can select controller uh and then color picker and it gives me a color wheel and then i can pick a color on the wheel hit select and it's hard to tell because it's covering it um i should have these on a separate separate boards but you can see there's a little orange there because it's lit up the neo pixel that is on the feather so um that's 
you know, kind of elementary, but it's cool that you're able, this is the first that I've seen where, where we were, I was able to, or seen somebody able to use BLE uh, with, with an RP2040. And what's cool about that is hopefully what I'm trying to figure out, my son and I are trying to figure out is how to take that and combine it with this, which is a, which is the joy feather wing, a joystick on the same board, and then actually have a, make a Bluetooth controller. That would be, that would be the goal. See if we get there. We've been trying to create a Bluetooth, a USB controller with some success, uh, although not able to do it for Nintendo Switch like we wanted to. But why not, if we could get it to be wireless, even the better. Uh, Jim says, uh, I don't feel all that old. I saw a computer with tape drive only at a tech museum. Oh, yes. We won't, we won't get into it here, but I think a few of us on this show have used those kind of tape drives with great seriousness. I just I have very fond memories of getting Compute Magazine, which I don't know if anybody here remembers, but they had programs in it and you had to type them. There was like, there were maybe five, 10 pages of code, usually basic, and you had to type it. And then you had to save it on the cassette tape and the cassette tape would take like, I don't know what, 15 minutes to save. And oh man, if you made one typo, you have some problems. So less less has them saved. So yep. anyway, uh, I wanna thank everybody. I wanna thank everybody for, for watching and listening as I wanna especially thank Dr. Scott Baker for joining us as our special guest. It was such an honor having you uh, as always you, uh, everyone can find us here at 2.30 p.m. Eastern, 7.30 p.m. GMT on on Tuesdays. Next week, we have our special guest, Spark Fun. And, of course, if you're not tuning in live, you can find us on YouTube, Facebook, and wherever you find audio podcasts. Bye, everyone. See you next week. <laughs>